that was the infamous Alex Maxi clap. Did you, everyone get that? <laughs> you might have to be done in post-production. <laughs> DT, this is like, this is so old school, man. This is so pandemic. It is, yeah, yeah it is. This is like going back and trying to remember how we used to do podcasts <clears throat> when we weren't allowed to mingle and we all had to uh, what was the word self-isolate or was the one, was yeah. so socially distance all Next those one. kind of weird topics yeah um so yeah but but this is happening not because anyone's ill it's because you're telling taking your well-earned break down in the uh, uh in the, in down the in Aldney. in, in fact Aldney. No, you're not on your well-earned break you're back i'm back I'm you're back. doing a bit of hybrid work yes exactly yeah but a hybrid Hybrid action, some flexible uh, scotty, which is great. From um, the so we've Alderney, got Alderney branch office. Um, yes, yeah, here. the Alderney branch. Ah, oh, great, that's good. <laughs> and uh, I'm in Bromley, and thank goodness we've also got Alexandra on the on on the on the Zoom, looking after the sound engineering. Because what no one will be hearing, which is what I'm hearing, is the sound of pneumatic drills in the street <laughs> right outside. Okay, um, because all of the pipe work's getting replaced. Uh, by the gas people, um, and I was I was listening actually in the week uh, to Flanders and Swan. Do you know Flanders and Swan, DT? I do. You know, yes, the, 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 the very famous you know, the hip the hippopotamus song yeah. is probably one that Alexandra might have heard. I of, know exactly, but I think the rest she won't have heard of. Um, but they have a great great one, which is the Gas Man Cometh. Do you know that one? I I uh, don't which is, know that one. It, but... it all starts. It starts with, with, with needing to get the gas man to come because they, they can't turn the gas tap. And then there's a series of basically errors through the week. So the gas man does it, but then he puts his, he needs, you know, she, they, they then need to call in a painter to, to paint over where he's been working. Right. Or, you know, or, the, or I think it's the electricity. But anyway, it goes through the week and you get all these people come in and then the punchline is that by Friday, whoever's the last person, which I think that probably is the painter, has painted over the gas tap and they can't turn the gas tap. So it all okay. starts all over again. So hey, right. it's a bit of comedy. Um, I know it's a massive digression for this month's horizon. Um, but anyway, that's what I've been up to with the gas people in the street. Um, great. DT, last month, you yes. know, we, we had Juan in talking about elections. We did. And, I think we recorded on the UK election you know, day, didn't we, if I recall correctly? Um, Absolutely, we did, and and you know, obviously, that was a a pretty foregone conclusion. But you can see post that, and particularly with what's happened in the U- the US, um, things things in in France actually have gone pretty quiet. And it's the Olympics, which is great, and and we're all loving that. Um, uh, so that's that that's really great. But but the things that you know, the moves in in the USA and the twists and turns of that election which have been so startling. But actually, what Juan predicted and, and, and talked about has actually been, you know, it's been really good foresight. Come to fruition, yeah. Um, you know, yes, there's been some twists and turns, but essentially, you know, what he's been saying and that, that message is, is pretty much there. Um, and, you know, we've got still time, haven't we? Trump has been named as the, the Republican candidate, hasn't he? That's right. Uh, so we've had his... His confirmation, his setting of a running mate. We've also had, shockingly, his attempted assassination. It's been quite a busy month politically. Uh, and then Biden, um, as Swan sort of alluded to, he thought it would, was coming, stepping aside. And Harris now, uh, who's not officially yet the nomination, but all his his votes have swung behind her, I think, at the, at the, the Democratic Congress uh, convention, sorry, not Congress, um, she will, she will, she will get the nomination, and then obviously have to choose her own running mate. Um, lots of debate about who that might be. What, none of which I'm too too hot to, to speed on, I'm afraid. Well, I think it's it, it, there's, there's going to be so much of this, isn't there, up until November, because it's going to you know further dominate the headlines. Um, and you know, we've been we wanted to talk about it really from a a, a sort of right left you know, swing and how polarised things are in the States. And, you know, we were talking about the UK and how it's been moving in a different direction to Europe. You know, we've been, you know, we've seen this kind of Labour landslide, this move to the swing to the left, whereas Europe's moving as it would seem to the right. The US, it would seem if, if Trump is successful to the right, but, but then if not, 
you know, then very much a swing the other way. It's a really, it, it, it's so pivotal what's going to happen. And obviously for the world of finance, the, 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 the areas that we really, you know, feel that there's going to be the change is around, you know, the ESG space and the climate space and the relaxation possibly of things there. Um, yeah, and also, I mean, so it's, you know, it's still all to play for. To, yeah, completely. And, and I suppose we're, we're circling back when we were talking a lot about geopolitical risks uh, in our sort of end of year piece last year. It's more political risk these. But, you know, there is the, the, the Trump trade, as it were, certainly post his assassination attempt. And when the, um, you know, the, he, he timed up massively in the polls. I think he was seen as a pretty surefire favorite. He's actually since drifted out. A fair bit now that Biden has stepped down, but you know, he his the, the movements I suppose in the chance of getting elected are directly influencing Bitcoin. There's been a big sort of call that if he gets through, um, there will be a big relaxation of rules around that and a big push in there. And then obviously there'll be tariffs from China. You know, you'd expect higher tariffs on China. So there's certain asset classes are moving along with the political movements of, of the chances of whoever winning so there's yeah there's a lot there's a lot out there and you know, we talked about it and we talked about it incessantly and it's never come to anything volatility has really picked up and actually we've seen a big sell-off today we're recording this on friday the second uh japan was down six percent overnight vix has spiked i think i looked at just before we went on over like this up 35 percent uh in the last two days since wednesday so you're starting to see Vol, which we just haven't seen for such a long time. Um, everyone's sort of been expecting, attempting to call a top. I don't, this may or may not be the top. I'm not even attempting to call that. But you're starting to see volatility. And with volatility, you know, you start to, un you can start to uncover issues uh, in markets. You know, we've seen it before as traders. Uh, you sort of like the vol because it, you know, there's lots of chances to make money as things are moving around. But you might find that a position that you thought was incredibly safe and sound and rather boring is suddenly not. <laughs> and that's where you find out things haven't been hedged properly, et cetera, all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, a, a lot to play for. And I yeah, suppose... No, it's, sorry. It, 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 no, I was going to say that, you know, those, those are the changes that, that start to uncover stuff. Mm. And also, we're in that, that tricky period, we're right in it now, where we're in the holiday period and... You know, inevitably people go away. There's the mandatory time away, MTA. Um, and you have a natural, you know, one juniorization of the desk if people are going away and people are left with responsibilities. I would have thought people will have taken the size of, of books down, you know, hampering liquidity. And maybe that's what's causing the pickup in vol. Yeah. Because why would anybody want to run big books into this US election now, the, the way it's poised. Yeah. You know, before when, when you had a, a very clear indicator or perception of, of, of where, you know, the direction of the wind might be, it's easier to position. But, you know, we're back in a kind of very uncertain space. We're over the summer. And maybe that accounts for some of that pickup involved, perhaps. I don't know. I mean, I'm, you know, we're not... We're not trying to call markets and stuff, but I just think to sort of illustrate stuff to, you know, people working in control about, you know, where difficulties could lie. And then the other thing that, that happens to, of course, when people do go out is, um, you, you know, you find very much that, that a fresh pair of eyes looking at the marks around a book and how things have been valued. Um, you do also start to uncover things, particularly when there's market stress. Because if you do get bouts of stress, then, you know, if people have been holding marks, you know, and, and, and been able to hold marks at levels that, you know, while things are calm and aren't really tested, they can get away with. It's very hard to continue that uh, behavior when things start to, to become more difficult. And of course, a new person is not necessarily going to want to you know, take responsibility. They they want you know their own uh, mark that they can they can be confident in. Mm. You know, that they can stand behind. So, could be interesting to see how things play out. You know, you talk about interest rates, DT as well. Obviously, we saw a move from the Bank of England. They're able to move because mm. the election is out of the way. It's done and dusted. Kind of different in the US, right? 
Very different uh, because, uh, and actually, I think part of the ball you're seeing in the last few days is you, you, there was a very bad employment print today, and it and it sort of the talk is that they feels that the Fed might be slightly behind the curve, as in they could maybe should have cut and they haven't yet. So yes, I mean that that cut in the UK, as you say, is is now kind of possible post election. You know, th- there's always the you know. You could be accused if you start cutting now that that's, you know, is that a democratic ploy? I mean, obviously, you claim that the Fed is independent, et cetera. But absolutely, yeah, it will, any movement, and you'd expect it would be a cut rather than a raise, there would be calls that that is, is that possible, you know, political, um, not interference, but you know what I mean, political movement. Yeah, so it's, it's going to be very, very difficult, I think, this summer. Uh, very very difficult. I mean, yeah, just kind of good job. We do have the Olympics to yeah. take everyone's mind off it. Yeah, I mean, just going back to your comment about uncertainty and, and markets just do not like uncertainty. And I remember seeing this a long time ago at the start of my career when we came in. I think I was at a hedge fund at the time. We came in on, on a morning and the US had invaded. It was Gulf War, probably part two, and the markets went on a tear. And I was like quite confused by that. And my boss told me he said. Look, what, what markets don't like is the uncertainty and the run up, uh, run up to it. Actually, once something has happened and you know what's happening, it sort of gives people a bedrock to then move from. And, and I think you're right that the, the Trump-Harris, uh, not rebalancing, I mean, he still is the favourite, but has injected some uncertainty. And, and, you know, it's, and as you've said, it's very you know, binary differences of, of what, what that can bring and people just don't like that. So in markets, you're, you know, you're starting to see it. So anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. And, and, and obviously you made, you made a comment, I think, about, about China and, and geopolitical uncertainty and so on. Did you see, so I'm d- desperate to get this in with the Olympics, <laughs> but have you seen the row that's going on around drug testing? Mm. It's, it's particularly come out in the swimming, but it, it's all been about how much more Chinese athletes have been tested than other athletes, and it's it's a huge, huge difference. Right, they're far more tested than any other country's athletes. Right, and that's turned into a political row um, because you know there are accusations that WADA is being political and is pandering to you know the the the, the you know the West's agenda. Um, you know, that they're out there, you know, trying to, um, you know, affect Chinese athletes' um, chances of success. Um, so that's an interesting kind of extension of the kind of the, the geopolitical row um, hmm. that, that's going on out there. And I think just further sort of, you know, f- you know fuels, uh, fuels, fuel, uh, fuel on the, the fire, the, the, possibly, the tension, I don't know. if you like. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's that's a, you know obviously uh, it was a I think it's a it, it was a great I really enjoyed doing that Horizon Unpacked last month. I know we've got a great one this month, but before we dive into what we're going to talk about this month, also you know want to thank William Taff for his um, podcast on cybersecurity and cyber regulation, and obviously that came about with CrowdStrike DT. Yeah, so which has also you know, what, been what's this been month. the kind of well, I was going to say, what's you know, what what what's what's your kind of perspective on CrowdStrike? Well, I think it it sort of plays into the the, the playbook of a lot of the regulators who have been saying to banks uh, and other institutions, mostly banks, obviously that's the area we tend to focus more on, that they need to be aware of third party risks down down the supply chain, and this is a classic example of that. You know, it was a small update that was rolled out badly or hadn't been checked properly before it was rolled out and has caused carnage in certain parts of the industry. Um, and I'm sure there will be many claims to come. But yeah, absolutely. It's, 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 it's just showing. And a, a lot of financial institutions do use a lot of third party type um, providers. You, we saw it with the um, Lockbit Ion uh, issue earlier in the year. You know, that, that caused you know, settlement stuff to collapse. People were running around the city with USB sticks to try and get trades settled um you know there is a big reliance on these externals that can cause problems so you know you need to these these areas and i'm sure audit teams are all over this but looking at what their third party risks are but it does bring it front and center of of of, of, of you know issues that can come up and there's real world you know real world examples of problems that this can cause um yeah 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think anyway that that's that's been great, and and people should really yeah, catch yeah. that. Podcast it was a great podcast. Because William also, yeah. I think, well, it was you know it wasn't one of our Horizon Unpacked, but I think I think what William did very 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 well was tried to give some vision um, as well, some forward looking stuff, and I really appreciated his comments about integrity mm. and the risks to integrity, particularly data integrity. Um, I thought that was really useful too. So big thank you to him, big shout out to him. Um, and, and let's look at this month now. So, you know, one of the things, DT, that we've, we've been talking about, and, and, you know, it's not just us. I think there's obviously it's been a theme is the, you know, how, uh, the, you know, the UK market has really been losing traction and, and losing its attractiveness to companies and people migrating overseas. Um, there's also been a kind of, you know, a view about, you know, performance, uh, you know, thinking much more in asset management terms about, you know, the UK market and and being an underperformer. You know, structurally, it's very different from other markets internationally. Um, there's probably less tech in the in the FTSE. There's a, there's a lot more kind of resources type, um, you know, old industry, yeah. if you like, as well. Um, but that doesn't really look at, you know, the, the non-listed market, you know, the, the unlisted portion of the market too. And there's obviously been, uh, you know, people have seen, you know, the, the big news this week um, between, you know, the tie-up between Schroders and Phoenix looking to set up, um, you know, a billion dollars worth of investment into, um, you know, private, private investments, but also, you know, non-listed investments, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah, that was. Uh, I think it was announced earlier this week, actually. But yes, it's. I think you. I, I've got the word wrong. There's, is it the Mansion House Compact or something you were talking about? I can't remember. But something along those lines, or maybe. <laughs> yeah. So that uh, you know, a lot of this, a lot of this comes out of the you know the yeah the Mansion House Compact ambition. Yeah. Um. So you know, trying to promote you know the objectives of that and and you know. We, Probably not going to dive into that for, for this podcast. People can, can Google that. And, hey, people can have a look in the Scardi Discord and join the tribe. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and look at some of the background. Um, but, you know, I think it's an exciting move, you know, and, um, and, and it's interesting in terms of our book of work. You know, we've had, particularly this year, you know, private um, lending, private investment has been a theme for us. Yes, yeah. Um, definitely. And, you you know, there seems to be no end of that. But I think also the other theme that we've observed too is just how, you know, in the search for yield and how competitive asset management has, be has, has become, you know, we started to see this move, you know, this rise in alternatives that really kind of gathered pace, you know, around about five years ago. But it's taking asset management firms as that, you know, competition, you know, re remains, you know, high into some areas which, you know, one were the preserve of, you know, the whole the wholesale markets, really, the wholesale institutions. So thinking much more, you know, around, you know, with, you know, things like, you know, you know, CLOs and, and that kind of, of um, that, that part of the market, which obviously, you know, of course, it's a managed product. But what I'm, I'm talking about the kind of the issuance of that and, yeah. and how those things come to market, that's very much sitting now in the, you know, that in the kind of the asset management arms of of of, of uh, institutions, um, and then you know also looking now into private markets, and I think it's interesting for us too. You know, looking back at, at you know what lessons, because if the, this is this does I think mark you know a continued shift, and it's really what people in in audit should be looking at. Where were the kind of the risk areas? You know, as their institutions move, and, and obviously you want these businesses to grow and, and grow safely so that they're successful and growth is good, growth is more fees, more profits, etc., more choice for, for investors, which is good. We will welcome all of these things. But it does, if not done correctly, you know, presents more risks. Um, and there was a lesson, wasn't there, really? I mean, the, the big lesson, um, which is, uh, you know, from, from Woodford. Yeah. Um, and and you know I think you know DT you're such a funds expert you know you, you and I did work on 
investment trust. You know, I think that's where we first it is, worked yeah. together. But mm-hmm. I don't, I don't hold myself out as much as an expert. That was a that was a point on my journey. Whereas <laughs> I think you've you've lived and breathed it I and have, continue yeah. to do so. So, you know, you can remind me right now. Um, Open ended versus closed end. So there you what's, go. What's the difference? The difference. And, and then and then when you've done that, you can also explain to me about ETFs, exchange traded funds, because. I've never really understood the excitement and the buzz around that part of the market. So you can enlighten me there. There you go. Well, okay. So open-ended funds, um, as, as I suppose the name vaguely suggests, the assets move up and down as people create and redeem units in those. So you, Nick, could go and go, I want to buy this latest XYZ FTSE tracking fund. Uh, and they would go, okay, well, you, here are five, they would take your cash and create you 17 units or whatever it would be. And then if you, a year later, said, oh, it's gone up or hopefully gone up, but <laughs> maybe gone down, uh, said, I want to sell out of that, they would take those, take the units off you and sort of destroy them and give you the cash. So the assets will, ra- will rise and fall as people uh, invest and, de- and divest money from it. Whereas a closed end, and then actually an ETF is is very similar to that. It's a sort of, it is a product that, that has all those characteristics. The, the, the slight wrinkle is how you re- create and redeem units. So you have market makers in it that aren't aren't the fund. You know, in an open-ended fund, sort of classic mutual fund, you deal direct with XYZ Asset Manager through your platform of choice. If you're buying or selling an ETF, actually you're tending to deal with a market maker, they will in essence, short that to you, and then they will buy all the underlying assets that that ETF replicates. They will take that two-sided package, as it were, which is completely hedged, and then they'll take that back to the asset manager who will then create or redeem those units as part of that trade. So that's the slight wrinkle. Okay. And, and, it's, and that improves their liquidity. And obviously, we've seen a massive explosion in the ETF universe, and they've moved from being sort of classical things that would track share baskets to to track multiple esoteric much more uh you know commodities bonds etc you know but areas of the market that retail wasn't really able to access for a long a long period of time and a closed end fund is which is where i started my career many moons ago um has two different valuation points attached to it, it has an nav so you, you as a fund manager raise money. Let's say you raise a hundred NAV. Sorry, net asset value. Apologies. NA, <laughs> net asset value. Um, so that is yeah, the yeah, yeah. the summation of the total assets in the pool. But then, if people buy or sell that, they don't trade with that manager. They trade against themselves. So the price will settle, as any price will, where you find supply and demand meet. So often these things and certainly in the UK a lot of investment trusts that are out there trade at a discount you know the assets are worth 100 but it, it trades on the market at 90 95 or whatever it is and possibly even wider than that um, so that's the difference but the great thing from a manager's point of view is they are they have a fixed pool of assets they know they're not for instance if people come in to sell a lot of it the price of it will fall but the net asset value might not and they're not being forced to fire sale an asset just at the wrong time to meet that 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 redemption request you know they hold on to that asset um, but you know because there isn't a redemption request correct. it's a selling request yeah, it's right? just, someone someone wants to you know alex if, alex if she would no longer wish to hold it exactly alex who is on this call she could have created a fund i've now that, that she sold to me i want to sell some uh, and you are the only buyer that I can find out there. Well, you might bid me, you know, 50, 50 cents on the dollar for it. And if we end up transacting at 50, I mean, it's more for me possibly, but Alex still has 100 that she's got invested. So that's, you know, the, the, the price of it is purely determined by supply and demand. And actually, we, there's been an interesting um, development, I suppose, this month, well, sort of last month and into this month, uh, which is what I was initially going to write Horizon about, but was slightly kiboshed. So um, Bill Ackman, a very famous US-based investor, has his own hedge fund, and he has a, a closed-end fund here listed in London and, and in Amsterdam. Um, and that trades at a bit of a discount. He was looking to launch a massive US closed-end fund himself to sort of replicate that strategy. Um, and I think the kicker was because it wasn't a hedge fund, it would have a lower fees. You know, you could get a lot of retail involved, etc. He was initially, I think he started looking to raise 10. 
got very confident and said he's going to raise 25 billion. That was then cut to two billion, and actually, a couple of days ago, just as I was finishing writing my bits, the whole thing has been pulled. And part of the reason for that was there was no real demand, and the problem might be that you would launch at NAV, and the price would immediately, you know, you're you're not investing at NAV in a way. Well, you are investing at NAV, but the minute it starts secondary trading, the price may well fall as it just moves out to a discount. Plus. If you believe he's got a good strategy, why not buy the London listed, which is currently trading at discount, rather than paying up at par to, to buy the NAV of the new listing? So they're, they're quite a... It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you, you make a great point about fees. Because fees, obviously, people care about fees. Yeah. And that has been a very big drive, particularly of the, of the UK industry. But I think globally, too you know, trying to keep fees low because investors generally have said they, they are sensitive to fees. Mm. So it sounds like an attractive thing. We'll bring a new type of fund which enables us to lower the fee structure. But set against that, because fees are hyper-competitive already, we might, we might all grumble about them, but it's a pretty competitive market out there, I, I think. My perception is Oh, yeah, that. especially in this ETF and world, absolutely, when, well, it, exactly. And then, and then when you set it against the risk of owning a closed-end fund, which, as you, as you rightly observe, without any mechanism to get at the assets, it's the market that's going to establish what that level is. And, and the other, you know, interesting thing for the control functions to think about, too, you know, when they're, when they're monitoring, you know, trader behavior, you know, traders are absolutely so good at reading and determining where risk is coming from. So if you have um, someone ringing you up, asking you for a price in a closed-end fund, you pretty much know which way they're going to go, or you can assess the risk that, well, look, this person is a holder. The likelihood is that they could well be looking to liquidate as opposed to take on more, and, and particularly based on past behavior. And then all of the other things that you can use to read into that, the fact that they probably have to check if they're, if they're institutional, you know, in three places, then probably already there's activity in the interdealer broker market that's informing you of what the likely direction of travel is. And that enables you, therefore, then to, you know, place your price, you know, skew your price yeah, yeah. one way or uh, another. But then, you know, say, well, I made a two-way. Um, so... You know, and, and for those kinds of funds, because again, they don't have that mechanism of open ending, um, then that, you know, the direction that that can be skewed can be quite exacerbated. Whereas with an open ended fund, you know, it's very difficult for you to start really trying to drive a big discount because people come in and arbitrage yeah, that exactly. very, very yeah, quickly yeah. And certainly to that's... maintain that pressure. Exactly. And that's one of the reasons ETFs have been so successful because they have that market maker. Um, presence, um, authorized participants. Sorry, I'm, I'm reaching for the word. Uh, they will, you know, if that starts to trade mm-hmm. at a discount, it's free money for them, you know, and they trade these baskets day in, day out. So they're, and they have, you know, hyper competitive uh, trading platform system set up that allows them to price these things, you know, second by second. If they see a discount starting to go, they will, they will look to close that thing up. So, um, absolutely. And I suppose where, so- sorry. Sorry, man. I was, I was going to say, you know, you know, from from all of that, um, the Wood Woodford situation mm. was was different again, wasn't it? Because that was quite nuanced, right? I mean, you're quite. You, you, I, I love listening to you talk about Woodford because you know you've really looked into this. Um, so, you know, what's what's the kind of the overview? What, what first of all, what was you know Woodford open end, closed end? What was the situation? It, it was an open ended fund. It was it's a USITS, which I'm going to probably get wrong. I probably ought to look up what that stands for. Uh, uh, da, 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 or I'm going to get it wrong. Anyway, it is a, it is it's an EU jurisdiction based fund structure that is an open ended fund, and they the, the point is they offer daily liquidity. So. They raise money and then people can uh, add or take money from that on a daily basis. Um, so, and, and people like liquidity. You know, they like to know that actually if they have a view on, I don't know, the tech sector and then they make a lot of money, they want to get out, that they can get out that day, that, you know, that evening, whatever it may be. Yeah. And the issue really around the Woodford stuff was 
part of the USITS ruling is you can have up to 10% of your holdings in unlisted products. And Woodford uh, was using this. So he's he had phenomenal performance when he was, uh, I think he was at Perpetual. He then launched on his own, and it was like the largest retail launch in, in I don't know, how in a long time, up in the billions. I, don't, I can't remember the exact number, I'm afraid. Uh, and obviously, everything went swimmingly to begin with. But after a period of time, he started to underperform. And one of the ways he was looking to improve his performance was to start investing in unlisted stuff. So obviously, the great thing about unlisted, if it comes to fruition, is these things go up 10x, 20x, 100x. If you if you pick the right ones, obviously, some may well go to zero. But he was starting to use that. Um, and I think the market started to get hold of that information. And actually, there was... I'm not sure if there were rumours or whatever it was that he was getting close to that breach of the 10% level, the 10% usage level. And the problem becomes this in a, in an open-ended vehicle, there becomes a massive first mover advantage if if you are a holder of that asset to run to the door to get to the door first to redeem your holding first because what will happen is you asset manager, let's say you you know you you have a hundred of assets and a big holder of 10 a 10% holder comes to you and says, look, I want out. Well, you have to sell 10% of your fund to meet that cash call, to, 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 to meet that redemption. The problem will be, though, if you have unlisted assets, is the assets, let's say, were also worth 10, possibly not good to be choosing the same number. Um, but the total NAV now that that has been resumed is now down at 90. So the 10 over 90 is now over your 10% limit. So you what you've done by the with that first mover advantage is you have forced all the other you you have an advantage over the, all the other holders who are now left with one more unlisted assets in concentration their, yes, in unlisted exactly and this is what happened and it was yeah. i think it was the kent county pension i think looked to redeem and it sort of started a snowball effect whereby he was having to sell more and more liquid assets to meet redemptions, and therefore his unlisted component was becoming a larger and larger percentage of the fund that at some point the uh, link, who were the fund administrators, just had to halt redemptions because the whole problem, it was, you know, was snowballing out of control. And then we have spent the last, well, quite a few number of years uh, working out what those assets are worth and paying people back, not the full amount that they were frozen at. But, you know, people's holdings were frozen, you know, and if that is part of your pension and it's now stuck, I, I mean, I suppose, Nick, you saw this sort of thing when you were looking at Lehman claims and stuff like this. You know, people own something that you, you just, you, you have to wait until until they work out what that's worth. That could be months, years, you know, decades possibly. And, you know, if you're if it's your pension you're after and you've got no income coming from it because you cannot access that, I mean, you might be able to sell it in a secondary market. I mean, would a retail player be able to do that? Probably not. And they're probably going to get lifted at completely the wrong price as they try and find that liquidity. So, yeah, that was the issue. And actually, I think it's... Sorry, okay, sorry. Well, no, it's like, you know, what, what I think is interesting in, in hearing you talk about this is I think that, that there can be so many kind of misconceptions. And, and you know, you th think about you and I, you know, our history of trading in the wholesale markets you know, there might be this assumption, first of all, you know, first misconception, listed equals liquidity, yeah. right? And that that's just not the case. Um, I mean, you know, sorry, I shouldn't say it's not the case. It's just that it, it's such a, it's a far more complicated situation than that. You know, certainly unlisted equals illiquid. Yeah. That, that, that I would, I would definitely support as a statement and people should understand that and should understand that when you have something that is unlisted over a long time horizon you would hope to really outperform and if you've got good diversification because you have a lot of different unlisted things and we, we you know we always you know we often observe at SCADI um, that concentrations are a, are a problem, right? Concentration risk is a problem in, in any asset class where you have over-issuance or whatever it, whatever it happens to be. Concentration is such a, a risk. Um, and so if you've got, you know, a diversified portfolio of unlisteds that over a long time horizon, 
you know, can outperform because the reality also is that there's a very real risk in unlisted stuff that you lose, um, you know, you, you'll have some real losers yeah. that could in fact even go to zero, right, as well. Um, and then you and I have traded things that are listed that are very, very illiquid. I mean, I'm th- thinking about, you know, if you go back to 1998 and you and I were trading those Russian funds with all of the kind of the, the, the problems of the GKOs in them. And yeah. that, that's another sort of interesting thing about, you know, the portion of, of how something can grow in the, in the, in the net, net asset value, the basic NAV, you know, GKOs was, was something that it did. But th- there were certain funds... Um, I remember there was one that, you know, made on SIAC in like 2,000 shares. And we were like, oh, this, this doesn't look right. You know, SIAC, 2,000, you know, that's nothing. We could make that a much bigger size. Um, but, but actually, it was, it was horrifically illiquid. We, we managed to get hold of a block, uh, which thought we, we, which made, made us feel like we could make this in big size because we weren't worried about getting lifted out of stuff but actually if we'd run into more sellers we would have been in big trouble yeah um so again you know the the idea that of something being listed doesn't necessarily equal uh liquidity um and uh, you know thinking about you know when i've bought private convertible bond issues or semi-private and club deals you know often the the requirement is that they have a listing yeah but you know, convertible bonds all trade in the OTC market. There isn't, there isn't, so they don't all do. There is some, you know, possibility to exchange trade certain issues in certain markets. But, you know, the fact that something's Dublin listed or Luxembourg listed doesn't provide any kind of comfort in, in liquidity at all. But he was doing so. He was doing a little bit more. There was a little bit more game, game, gamesmanship, wasn't there, with listed there, stuff? There was. And this is, um, so hilariously, before we started r- working out what to write on this week and record on, Nick's like, "Well, you're out in the Channel Islands, Damien. You're out in Alderney. You know, find a find a local story that we can sort of, you know, there must be a sort of a vault or something. We can start talking about gold." And <laughs> I was sort of scratching my head to try and come up with something. But bizarrely, this story does actually touch on that. So. Alderney is part of the bailiwick of Guernsey. Uh, Guernsey does have an exchange, um, although I don't think it trades very often. There's probably a lot of things listed on it, and I think there's a lot of trusts, hedge funds, etc. there. But coming back to your point, that doesn't necessarily mean anything to do with liquidity. And what um, Woodford was doing was listing some of these unlisted on Guernsey, so it, which is a slight, I think, if you look at reports that have been written post the... the um, the issue, it, it's, a, it's playing slightly fast and loose with the USITS rules. But what it would mean is that he could go, well, actually, you know, he has 20% of unlisted stuff, but 10 has, 10 has been listed in Guernsey. But that, you know, there's, there's no liquidity there. You know, you, you know, let's say he has 100,000 units of this thing. You come to try and sell one, you know, he's the only owner of it. So it's, mm-hmm. you know, if someone's selling one, it's probably him. The price is probably zero or not that far off. So it was a, a classic case of trying to, of I suppose, you know, trying to be smart, look at the rules, look at how we could play a bit fast and loose yeah. with them to, to, to. It's, 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 a, it's absolute front office yeah. Behavior. Yeah. It's the front office playbook. You know, you look at the rules and you work out how you can maximize, you know, your profitability around the rule structure. And that obviously went to the max in 2007, 2006, 2007, before the inevitable global financial crisis. And, you know, I, one of the things that really concerns me about front office versus control functions is the ability for the front office to hug a rule structure and really kind of make hay with that and if you are if you're having a a control function that's very much focused on policies procedures running through the kind of what you know what we would call the you know the box ticking type interrogations um, or you know reviews but do not look any further into actually questioning, you know, what 
actually does this business do? How does this business make money? How are they, you know, yes, there's a policy, but is is that policy robust that it's actually going to control behavior? Because this is a classic example of, you know, him saying, well, you know, I'm within the rules. I'm within the rules here. I mean, maybe, maybe it's been found that he necessarily wasn't, but it, it's, it's absolutely following that rule structure to create um, an advantage for yourself yeah, and make I, life easier for yourself, it, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think and, and adding to that and with more of an asset management hat on, um, slightly coming back to the discussion you were talking about earlier about when we were trading funds, trading that Russian, Russian fund, you know, that was a, an equity fund. And it's, but the, the thing that would happen is you would write a prospectus which says we will attempt to buy undervalued Russian assets, or under, as, Russian equities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what it wouldn't say is, and also invest in GKOs. And the fact is that a lot of these funds went into that GKO trade because it was a slight no-brainer, as in these things were on huge yields. But that's a massive mission creep from what your prospectus says. Now, if if your question is in the control function is, is buying a GKO in a Russian equity fund uh, viable from this perspective? Well, it doesn't say I can't, so therefore, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it. And I think this was one of the slight issues at Woodford, as in certainly when he started, I'm not sure if he ever sort of put his hand out to say, I'm going to be starting trading in, in unlisted stuff. It was more of a, a chase for performance. Uh, and also, his, you know, he realized under usage rules he could have 10% unlisted, so why not? But it does call into that question, that whole looking at document, you know, a trader looks at documentation one go, way and goes, okay, how can I... If it says it, I can't do it, then I might be able to do it. But uh, I wouldn't. So if it says, if it doesn't explicitly say I can't do it, as in, you know, I had a fund and we launched, and, you know, writing a prospectus is a pretty painful affair. But it was very clear in the paragraph about what we could and couldn't invest in. We, we were trading futures only at the time. And that was all we could trade. For instance, if we were like, actually, we're going to, we've, we've grown, let's start investing in some equities, we would have to go back to, our directors to get that approved, we'd probably have to approach each single shareholder to get that approved. So that we we wanted to tighten that up to be a pretty specific paragraph. Uh, you've seen a lot of bond documentation. You've seen a lot of documentation in your time. But you know, pe- traders will look one way, while a control function might go, well, look, you know, it's it's still a tick. You know, he's it doesn't say he can't do that. So you know, there, therefore, it's yeah. fine. So. Anyway, slight <laughs> digression. I think that's so so true. I think the other thing we're talking about too, with you know, with anything that's private or you know less liquid, it all goes down to valuation. Yeah. And you know, I think what what we've seen over the years um, are some really interesting cases where you know people in finance, proactive people in finance, have worked really hard around um, uh, unlisted and private valuations to really interrogate what these things should be worth. And, you know, in the case of someone like Woodford um, and, other, you know, others, you know, you know very strong, uh, successful front office people that, you know, as a result of it become... Um, it becomes very difficult to challenge them, very hard to challenge them. Um, you certainly can have situations where, you know, people can be economical with the truth around valuations. One with just, you know, how they're valuing stuff and picking stuff, but I think willfully blind to other price references in the market. Um, you know, they can, they can be as stark, by the way, as... Um, you know, being in a kind of, um, a, a, you know, bipartisan trade was, you know, in two parties and one party's valuing that portion, you know, one way and the other side is valuing it another way. And there can be a kind of willful blindness around, you know, not interrogating what the other party is valuing something at mm. and, and a, a very sort of quick, you know, rush to sort of say, well, they're they're a different kind of 
um, business. They do value it differently from us. And sometimes that is legitimate. But often the case actually, you know, you've got to look very, very hard at, you know, where, where people are, are valuing stuff versus you, how you are valuing stuff. And also any kind of, you know, assumptions where people are bootstrapping um, things to help arrive at a, you know, bespoke valuation structure, which makes use of things that helps the front office achieve a valuation that they want, or in this case, you know, the asset managers, right? They are the front office in the, in this case, um, where, you know, they may be making use of, I don't know, recovery rates for a certain type of, uh, you know, corporate bonds versus other types of bonds, etc., because it just makes better reading yeah, yeah. for what they're trying to do. And it's that kind of nitty gritty where I think people can really find themselves um, getting, getting, you know, run rings around um, people. So I think um, that, that these are, you know, the kind of the lessons of what, you know, what came out of the financial crisis and a lot of the work that we did, you know, back then, mm. um, I think that equips us well to really help um, people. You know, now you you know, as we see asset management moving into kind of, you know, deeper waters. I would say, you know, it, it's an exciting time. I mean, I think certainly if you're if you're in an asset manager, you know, you and, and people starting out in their careers, I'd, I'd really think about moving into that arena uh, somewhere to work because it's 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 getting very very exciting the kind of things that you're going to touch and look at it's getting really really good it's a really competitive area um, but I do think that there is a that there's huge risk you know with what's happening if this is not done right and we do want it done right we, we want it done well so that investors have choice you know people are successful they have the ability to grow safely um, and more fees can be won. That, that's all. This is all good stuff. You know, no one wants that not to happen. Um, but there is real risk going on with with what's happening um, out there. Well, DT, I think that's, that's been a really great topic. Looking, you know, looking forward. Um, we just sort of touched on there about you know you know people looking at careers. Of course, we're at that time of year now, aren't we? People, congratulations to everyone who's getting their you know, university results. I think there's, there's, there's been a few, you know, uh, I've seen on Instagram lots of graduations, uh, <laughs> which is great. Anybody um, thinking about a career in finance, um, hope you're listening to the Skydy podcast um, because you've got a view into all, all different sides of finance. Um, but, you know, particularly as well, you know, the, the benefits of working in the control functions, working to you know, protect one of the biggest industries, or probably the biggest industry in the UK, but globally as well, such a big industry um, that does uh, does have uh, such impact and effect. Um, we also have the Discord, don't we, Damien? We where do, yeah. you can well, become uh, part of the tribe, as, yeah. as Alexandra describes it. <laughs> yeah, we save and, a lot uh, of the documentation some, you know, all, for, for, what, for these podcasts. And actually, we have... You know, we've we've done podcasts on specific themes, you know, way back when. That you know, there's a big tre treasure trove of information re regarding these sort of things we've looked at. And uh, yes, yeah, so every single horizon, every month, we there's there's a number of articles that we drop in there that we use to reference. You know, the, the piece that we write, and that obviously we speak about here on the uh, un Unpacked podcast. Yes, and if you're using the the Sky podcast for your continuous professional development. Um, you will find uh, also a certificate in there for this particular month's horizon, um, which will credit you. I haven't seen how long we've been uh, talking on for DC, but I think we can <laughs> certainly give people an hour, I would think, because obviously an hour listening time plus review time of materials, yeah. um, then I think that would be fair. So uh, if you want to claim that too, get yourself into the Discord um, so that you can then go and take that to your you know, your professional body, your organization, or whoever runs your training, just to evidence um, that you are keeping yourself up to speed. Um, so that's uh, that's it for the July version of Horizon. Um, shout out tonight and good luck to Sam Reardon, 
who's from the club, from Blackheath and Bromley Harriers. Um, he uh, has been promoted to the Olympic squad. Um, you know, nice young lad. Um, and he's in the heats, I think, tonight for uh, the 4 by 400 meter relay, about uh, 10 past six tonight. Amazing. So I really hope that goes well for him. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, it's very exciting now as we move into this next phase of the Olympics. Yeah, athletics um, to come. Really, really good performances all round. Good stuff. All right, DT, we're well, safely back from Alderney. Hopefully Thank when you. we speak next, we'll all be in the uh, studio together with Alexandra and we'll, we'll be able to hear her clap in person. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs>